Well, tonight uh, I'm excited, but I say that a lot <laughs> because it's true. Um, as we get into these texts and stuff and the topics that are coming up, I just get excited about it. Right out of the, the pages of Scripture, there's, there's just this unending wealth of goodness that's there. So let me give you a quick overview of some of the things we're going to be doing tonight. Uh, we're in Romans 11. We'll be in verses 33 through 36, finishing the chapter. And we're going to study a New Testament worship song. That's really how I see it. This is like a worship song is really what it is. Um, we're also going to learn a very important Greek word. So are you ready for this? This, this is going to be very hard. A very hard, complicated Greek word I'll teach you tonight. And we're going to talk about what it really means to lose your life for Christ. Because there's sort of a, almost a paradox about the idea of losing our life for Christ and what we gain in return and so I think it all is going to tie together in a beautiful little rainbow of love. So <laughs> Romans 11, verse 33, let's just read the passage. Here's, here's our worship song. It says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor? Or who is first given to him and it shall be repaid to him? For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Now this is what we call, the fancy word for it is a doxology. How many of you guys are familiar with that word, doxology? Most of us, it seems, are. Um, and it means like it, it's, a, it's a formal statement, something like a poem or a worship song, uh, a declaration of God's glory. You're speaking of God's glory. That, that's that word doxa for doxology. It means glory and then Ology can mean the study of, but it can also mean like a, a speech or a proclamation, something you're spoken. So it's a spoken, uh, speaking of God's glory is, is the idea. So we have um, this, the song we sing, it says, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's a dox, in fact, we call that song doxology. Um, there's actually probably quite a few songs out there floating around with that same title, doxology. Well, this, uh, this is a worship song just without the music. So a worship song without the music would be a worship, I guess, perhaps. But I, I think that we can learn a lot as we study this passage. So uh, one of the first things I'd like to point out is this, is that we should both think and feel our worship. Worship is, is multidimensional because humans are multidimensional. And if worship is, as uh, I like Warren Wiersbe put it this way, worship is the response of all of man to all of God. So I'm, I, all of me is responding to all of God. All, his, all of man, heart, soul, mind, strength, all that I got, responding to all that God is. Who he is, what he has said, and what he has done. And uh, I'm reacting to all those things. Uh, I, I think that's a good description of what worship is. So that means I should think and feel worship. That it's not one or the other, but it's both. And personally, I know we tend to gravitate towards one side or the other. Uh, people tend to be the feelers, or they tend to be the thinkers. And the feelers, they look sometimes look down on the thinkers, like, you're two-dimensional, you just don't get it, right? And the thinkers look down on the feelers, like, you're dumb. You're not smart like me, right? But in reality, these, these things should not be playing against each other. Like, do, would you rather, you know, it, it's as though you're choosing between, do you want to be a good parent or a good spouse? Well, how about both? I mean, maybe we should be doing both of these things, and the thinkers should be learning from the feelers instead of marginalizing them as though they're missing out instead of realize, no, you are seeing something that maybe I'm missing out on. And the feelers should look at the thinkers and think the same thing. Maybe there's something I can learn and grow from you. We're all different parts of the body. We, we maximize different gifts and things. Um, we should, though, on the thinking side, we should consider deeply our worship songs. I love scripture songs. I love songs that draw right out of the text of scripture. All other songs, I really want to evaluate very carefully. And I'm, as a worship leader, I do this. I evaluate songs, and sometimes I pull a, a verse out of a song. I'm like, without that verse, it's a great song. Or you have those songs that have a great chorus and a slightly heretical verse. And you're like, oh, no, what do I do? I want to do this song because of the chorus. But, and so people will tell you, they'll, they'll go, I love this song. And then I'll go, have you ever listened to the words? And they go, no. No, I haven't. And I'll well, let's, let's consider that before we ask the church of God to sing these words. Let's think if we, we should sing them or not. Because God wants our brains and our hearts. Um, so some people, uh, the, the, the feelers perhaps, I'm, I know I'm generalizing here, but just to make a point, the feelers perhaps, they don't want to think about these things too deeply because they feel like they'll lose the feeling side of things. 
but you, you won't. In fact, if you do this properly, it should enhance that. And then the thinkers almost, almost sometimes delight in not feeling. Other ones, they realize, if I'm not feeling, maybe, maybe there is a dimension that I'm missing out on somewhat. In which case, we're all, we're all broken people. We're all missing something, that's for sure. Um, but don't marginalize it. That, that would be my advice. So I would say this. Um, beware what worship songs you choose to sing. Be thoughtful about what worship you do because worship is one of the main ways Christians learn their theology. You'll find people quoting worship songs to get themselves through hard times. Quoting worship songs to answer questions that they've got. As though the worship song itself was scripture. And so I want to, like, as I'm, personally, as I'm singing through a worship song, I'm honestly thinking of scripture. What scripture does this come from? What scripture is supported by this? I, I think that that's a good, healthy habit to have so that you can sing it with all of your heart and your mind. Because if something has words, it's communicating something. This is a hard concept for some, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but if it has words, if this song has words, it's communicating truths. If it's an instrumental song, it's only communicating feelings. But if it's got words, it's communicating facts and truths. So it's important those truths be real and be true. Um, I would say this, if a worship song cannot stand without its music, if it cannot stand just lyrics alone and be worthwhile, then why are we singing it? But if it can stand with the lyrics then we'd like it to have some nice music. That'd be nice. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd, be, that'd be wonderful. That'd be, that'd be sweet. I actually looked up for worship songs of this passage in Romans, and I found a lot of stuff online where people just wrote their own song. But in my opinion, musically, they were kind of, Neh, you know, because it's hard to sing this. Like, oh, the depth of the riches about the wisdom and knowledge of God. And it ended up being more of a, you know, you know, <laughs> not, not maybe the most musically pleasing thing in the world. So I thought I'll just read it instead. Um, I would say, though, we, while I should be critical of the worship music I listen to, and, and especially that which I, I choose to bring into the church for us to sing, um, I don't want to be hypercritical. And I see that a lot. Um, I just say, love God more than you love the music. So that you have the guts to say, even though my heart is attached to this song because of some feeling issues, I, I realize it's not maybe solid. And... Perhaps you're in the church and you hear a song and you're going, ooh, I don't know about that. The way that lyric hits me, I don't like that lyric. I don't think that's right. I would say, don't sing that lyric. Are you crazy? Don't say things you don't mean. You know, <laughs> I sometimes in worship will not sing a line or I'll sing it differently. I will enjoy just making up my own words, not usually while I'm leading worship, sometimes unintentionally. <laughs> but, but I would say, just don't sing a line or sing a line differently and spend that time in prayer. I've, I remember though... Um, a song I heard on, on K-Wave years ago. It's not on there anymore. Thank you, Lord. But it said, um, if I, and, and I have to summarize because I don't remember all the lyrics, but it was basically, if I could like ascend into heaven and see you in all of your glory, God, I would not love you more than I love you right now. And I just thought, that's incredibly arrogant and definitely not true. <laughs> if I saw God in the fullness of his glory, I wouldn't love him more than I do right now. Well, that's kind of sad. <laughs> that's kind of depressing. Unless, of course, my love for God is so amazing. It's so perfect and so full. I mean, I am love at that point. I mean, it's just weird. It was just a weird song. And I didn't know how. I actually tried to find it online, but it wasn't. I wasn't able to find it, which is probably good. Um, so be thoughtful about it. Be thoughtful about it, about the lyrics, about the words we sing. That would be my recommendation. Because look at the type of songs we see in the scripture in the book of Psalms, and also several songs we see in the New Testament, including the one we're studying tonight. These songs are deep. This is theology mixed with heartfelt praise, and that to me is, is great. This doesn't mean you have to have only old songs. I like old songs. I like to play old songs. I like to sing with old songs. But some people think new songs equal lame songs or shallow songs. And I've heard people mock or ridicule modern worship bands for having shallow songs, and then I look at their lyrics and I go, that's profoundly biblical and deep. Someone's studying theology when they wrote this song. And I love it. And I'm like, let's do it. So we want to look at it and consider it. Um, so some people avoid the intellectual side, but we, we should not do that. Others, they avoid, maybe, avoid the feeling side. Um, almost, almost wanting to push away from that. And this is maybe a minority, but I, I think that 
you should stir your heart to love the Lord in worship. A deliberate act of worship to God where you are stirring up your own heart in praise. Not fake, that's never acceptable. But there is, a, there's, like if you've, if you've been married, you know that there, you can stir your heart in love to your spouse. Or you can not. And there's results one way or the other, depending on how I react to this thing. I can stir my own heart in love towards the Lord as well. I can, I can focus on that. I can make choices in that regard. So um, what, what do you do, though, if you're going, I just don't feel it in my worship, but I want to feel it. I would say, actually, when I say f you're feeling it, what I mean is how much you mean the things you're saying. When I say, God, all glory to you. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. If you really mean it, well, then you're in the, you're on the, I'm feeling it level. That's, I don't mean necessarily emotional butterflies. I mean intent, depth of commitment that, <clears throat> that goes into that worship. So um, let's look again at Romans 11, verse 33 through 36. Um, this is, this is their, the song. Let's read it again, get it into our minds. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out for who has known the mind of the Lord, who has become his counselor, or who is first given to him, and it shall be repaid to him. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. What inspires this moment of praise is theology. Um, it's, it's a spontaneous thing. Paul, like the way he writes, like he gives into these like spontaneous moments of worship. But it's not like he's like ADD, like he's a squirrel, you know, and he suddenly throws out a worship moment in the, in the letter. I think that he's, he feels the seriousness and the wonder and the goodness of the things he's writing. And then he goes, oh, praise the Lord. Oh, God is good. L don't miss the point, guys. It's about God's glory. It's about God's amazing, wonderful goodness that we're seeing. Now, we've just spent several weeks studying topics in Romans 9, 10, and 11 that a lot of people are not interested in. And we've been looking at the theology of it and the deep meanings of things, and it's led to worship. I think that people who will focus on theology should automatically walk into worship. Worship just flows naturally out of theology. It just comes naturally out of this experience of, like... God's eternal. Wow. God's eternal. God, you're up. Wow. I, I just want to praise the Lord. God's good. God's with me in my hard, hard times. Oh, that's amazing. Like, this isn't just a dry, dead theological point. So we've, we've studied some things some people don't really care that much about. But then it's all kind of summarized. What's the payoff? Like, how does Paul get from the theology about Israel and the Jew and the Gentile and all this stuff about the complicated way in which God revealed the gospel and the mystery in Christ and all that? How does he get from there to worship? Um, let, me, let me summarize some of these things. In Romans, what we've learned so far as we're pulling these threads together to a time of worship and response is that mankind has universally sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Okay, you're not, you're not worshiping yet. This is not the... <laughs> It's not the part that inspires you. This is the bad news. This is the part that kind of scares you. Uh, so mankind is universally sinned, but that God brilliantly brings Jews and Gentiles together in Christ under this merciful gospel message that we're, we're all saved by grace. Yet he used the, the Jewish people to bring the oracles, the truths of God, to bring this prophecy, to lay the foundational work for Messiah when he comes, to then show the mystery revealed that I can be saved by the grace of God simply through faith in Jesus Christ. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And then those who come to Christ, we've talked about Israel, but now we're shifting back to the church. You're part of the church. Yes, there are people who are of Israel who are also part of the church, and there are Gentiles who are part of the church, we're all, but there's still a national Israel plan. We talked about that last couple weeks. But here in the church, it's just, we're all just saved by grace. And we have this eternal blessings and eternal life through Christ by faith. Um, you'll be more excited about it when we go to heaven, I imagine. <laughs> but, but it's pretty amazing if you ask me. And so we have this gracious God that's revealed in scripture. This God of mercy and love and grace who the people are fallen, but God's reaching out to them in love, saving whoever wants to receive him. I mean, the patience and the love of God. And so, of course, he says, look at God. Look at the depths of his riches and wisdom and knowledge. And, oh, he, he did all this to show us love and grace and mercy, 
to bring us into eternal love relationship with him. Now, this, this causes Paul to worship. And, and if theology doesn't cause you to worship, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. Listen to some different theologians if, if that's what's happening to you. Or read a different book or something, you know, or just read the Bible maybe. <laughs> and let yourself respond to the theology that you're learning. Because until you react, until you respond, you're not getting it. You're not getting it. It's, it's the difference of I know and I know, right? Like if someone goes, like, God's good, and you go, I know then you're not getting it. If someone says God's good and you go, I know. Now, okay, now you're getting it, right? It's, it's hitting you. It's hitting your heart. Have these things hit your heart? Have you gone in the Romans to the place of praise and worship? That's the question. So today you should be inspired to worship, right? If, if you learn of God's sovereignty, this inspires your heart to have peace and to trust in him and his plan for your future. When you learn of God's love, it causes you to feel a satisfaction in his love and to love others with a self-sacrificial love too. That's you responding to the theology. When you learn about God's holiness, it totally humbles you. You're like, (laughs) look at me, you know, compared to this holiness. And you get humbled and you're responding to that. Uh, When you learn about God's power, it sets you in awe. And you just stand before God like, I'm amazed. So this is us reacting to theology. So let's now, let's go through phrase by phrase. Pardon me. And it says in verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. The depth of the riches. That, that is how deep are his riches or how excellent is the value of what? Of his knowledge and wisdom. But, but first, let me teach you the Greek word I promised. Are you ready? It's the, in the English, it's the word O oh, in verse 33. Now, I'm going to teach you how to pronounce this in Greek, but I want you to say it back to me. You ready? Say O. Oh. That's the Greek. Oh, <laughs> and, and what it is in Greek and in English, it functions, the word functions the same. It's really the same word in both languages. And the way it functions is just what you're doing is you're putting emotion into the paper. You know, like if, if I go, oh, and that's my response to a text. Someone sends me, I go, oh, I'm, I'm just putting emotion down in the text. That's what I'm doing. So here it's putting emotion. So Paul's saying, oh, the depth of the, not just the Look at the depth of the riches, but like, oh, there, there's that response. There's this reaction. And so we should be mirroring this in our lives to respond with, oh, to what God has done. Um, so what is it that makes him say, oh, well, it's the depth of the riches or the exceedingly great value of two particular things, God's knowledge and his wisdom. Now, knowledge and wisdom are, are similar, and sometimes they're used kind of interchangeably, but they're not identical. Uh, knowledge is knowing information, knowing things. God knows everything that will happen, everything that could happen, everything that is happening, um, every variable fact of life. God knows all of this stuff. And so we're, when we look at his plan, we see how much he's factored in all, everything in life. Not just your life. We're talking all of humanity, all of the universe, all of the plan of history. God's got it all known and, and, and figured out. But imagine if God had that knowledge, but without wisdom. Like, didn't know what to do about it. I mean, that would be impossible for God to have, be less than what he is. But, but if he did, you, you, can, you can then picture the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Wisdom is really knowing how to do something well. I like to say wisdom is skill at living life from a human perspective. That's wisdom. It's like, you don't just live life, you live it well. It's, it's skillfully. Life. You do that skillfully. Um, well... This, I think, speaks of God's plan. So God knows all the variables of reality and and all that will happen. But he also has this wisdom in how he crafted the world and how he set everything up and how he interacts with mankind to bring about certain purposes that are of eternal value. In this case, we see Christ, we see the Jews, we see the prophecy, we see, we see being united together in him. And so we see God has plan. So God's plan is not damage control. God's not reacting to what happens like, oh man, oh gosh, well maybe if I do this, it'll make it a little better. Rather, there is a divine purpose and plan being carried out that was known from before time. Before time, which is itself nonsensical, but you get the idea. <laughs> which was known uh, outside of time, five seconds before time started. Um, so wisdom is knowing how to do something well. Um, I think that when you realize God's knowledge and wisdom, that he knows every factor, including the stuff you have no idea about, and he has a beautifully wise plan, 
then you understand the idea of trusting the Lord with all your heart, leaning not on your own understanding, just acknowledging him in all your ways and letting him direct your path. And so you don't have to have everything figured out. You don't have to know everything. You know the old phrase that the older I get, the smarter my parents become? The old phrase, it's, it's like, oh, the older I get, the smarter my parents become. Because I'm starting to realize that they did see some stuff that I didn't see. And now as I get older, I see those things too. And I go, oh, no. I get. So this happens. Um, well, the older I get, the smarter the Lord becomes. <laughs> or the more I realize the depth of the, his wisdom and knowledge. And so I react to this and I can go, you know, you never ever in the Christian life, you never graduate beyond walking in faith. And trusting God with the results. It's never going to happen. And we get in a point where our lives, we, we, we feel like everything's kind of like in a way that functions and makes sense to us. And then something comes and upsets the apple cart. And then all of a sudden we're like, oh yeah, I have to walk by faith, don't I? And so you never get beyond this. You never get past this. So we're always going to walk trusting God. Trusting in God. And trusting his word. Because the one who knows all things and is wise beyond measurement, he said, trust me, here's how you do it. Sometimes it, it strikes me as, as strange when I hear people try to come up with excuses to not do things the way God says in his word. I mean, it's pretty clear on most things. And they're like, should I really, is this really going to work? Is this, is this really, I remember when I was younger saying that I wanted to observe God's commands for how I would future date and, and become engaged and get married to my wife and stay pure before marriage. And people were like, let me know how that works out for you. And these were Christians. And I'm just like, I'll tell you what, you rebel against God's clear commands and tell me how that works out for you. And they would say things like, how are you going to know, you know, that, there, that there's really chemistry if you don't kind of, you know, do some stuff? And I'm just like, your wisdom, God's wisdom, which one do you think I'm going to listen to? Which one do you think I'm going to listen to? And I mean, that's now statistics bear out that those who stay you know, pure before marriage, that their marriages actually last statistically at way higher rates than those who, who check the chemistry first. God's wisdom is right in all areas of life, in all areas of ministry, as decisions we make on how we'll do ministry. Should I water down the text? Should I just teach it as it is? I've made it my goal in my teaching to try to get a clear biblical understanding as much as possible into the minds of everybody I get to minister to, rather than trying to juggle entertainment versus, versus teaching versus um, pandering, which that part I just want to throw away. I'm not interested in the pandering. I want to bring clarity. I want to bring truth, but I'm not, I don't, I don't want to go down that road because I don't see Jesus doing that. I don't see God doing that in the text. So why would I do that? So God's ways of his wisdom and his knowledge, his wisdom and his knowledge. And then this means that when he first set the universe into motion, he had a brilliant plan and this is revealed in Romans. We've looked at this in a few. So let me remind you. In Romans 9.22, we learned that part of the plan was that God would show his holiness in judging sin. He'd reveal his holiness. And that's a glorifying thing to God. That's a good thing to God in judging sin and sinners. But also to show his love and mercy on everybody who chooses him. That's 9.23 and Romans 10.13. That he's choosing to show love and mercy. This has been part of the plan from the beginning. Part of the major issues that he wanted to accomplish was showing his mercy. Also to reconcile us to himself. This has been, don't you see trees are not part of the plan in this sense. They're not like this, this is the point. But the point is here to, sh to God to reveal to us who he is. To, to give us a restored relationship with him, reconciling to himself. And also like Romans 8, 28 says that we be the firstborn, he be the firstborn among many brethren, this family of God. But also to reconcile us to each other. We're the brethren thing, it's, it's. God's plan is all about relationships, is what it's saying. It really is about relationships. And haven't you found in your life that relationships are the single most important thing there is? Even more important than video games, and money, and job opportunities? It's really relationships. That's what it all comes down to. And it, and it does for the Lord, too. Now, when I let my heart and mind respond to God's wisdom and his knowledge, if you actually stop for a moment and seriously think about this, he knows everything and he's got a plan for all of it then I can have peace. I can have peace. Because he's a good and wonderful God and he's got all this stuff figured out. I can rest. If I'm in him, if I'm yielding to him and surrendering to him, I can rest. If I'm not, I'm, I can worry. 
how can I challenge God or how can I doubt him in this area? A quietness comes over me and I can actually respond like this because I'm a guy that likes to search things out as most of you guys are. You like, I want to know stuff. I want to understand things better. But, but let me read to you Psalm 131. This is a really long psalm at three verses in length. I'll read, I'll read two thirds of it for you. It says in Psalm 131 verses one and two, Lord, my heart is not haughty or arrogant, nor my eyes lofty, Neither do I concern myself with great matters nor with things too profound for me. Surely I've calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. I've become that humble, like little child where I'm just not going to worry about all that stuff. You know, there's times where your kid gets in the car, little kid gets in, they don't know where you're going. They don't even worry about it. I don't know. I just know I'm with mom. I just know I'm with dad. Where are we going? I don't know. And sometimes that's life with the Lord. Where am I going? I don't know, but I know I'm with the Lord. And so there's a calmness that comes when I go, God, you have knowledge, you have wisdom, and these things are complete. I don't need to fret over figuring everything out. Now, I like to try to figure out as much as I can, but you can only throw that rock so far. You know what I mean? You can only get it to such a distance of knowledge and understanding on your own. And there you just stop and you go, Lord, those are the things that are just too profound for me. I don't get it. I don't know. And I trust you with those things. This you've got to do. So you'll have rest and quietness. Um, In hard times, you'll have hope. You'll see a good God. And also, it's not only going to give you a quietness, it's it's going to put some fire in you to run for the Lord because you look at your life and you know it's not just random. You know, you're not... You're not, you're not the Christian version of like shrub number three in the school play of the kids. You know how they have like a kid's play and they have too many kids in the play, so they make them all plants? <laughs> like you're, you're shrub number three. You know, that's you. Like, is this you as a Christian? You feel like, I'm just here to, I'm just, you know, they had to find a spot for me, so here I am. But yet, if you look at God with his wisdom and knowledge and you know that it really has a lot to do with you, this plan, this agenda, an eternal plan for you, then it encourages you, even though you don't know the whole plan, you're not really sure how it all works out, but it encourages you to run for the Lord in your life. Like your life makes a difference. I decided a long time ago to live my life like it mattered because the scripture tells me it does. To live for the glory of God, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Just, do, just go for it in the Lord. And it doesn't mean everyone's going to have this giant worldwide ministry. Just imagine what it would be like if everybody had that. Everybody would be watching their own stuff. (laughs) It means that your life really matters. You're an eternal soul impacting other eternal souls in important ways. And so you see God's plan in your personal life. You you run more and you trust more and you rest more. I like that. Then it goes on. It says, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. I like this a lot. I think this is a biblical case for not assuming too much. It doesn't say here, you guys, you're Christians and you have the Spirit, so you know all of God's judgments and you can figure out all of his ways. It says the opposite, doesn't it? His ways are past finding out. His judgments are unsearchable. You you don't get to impeach God. You're not, oh, if I can just, I can figure out why God's doing what he's doing. If I could just think long enough and hard enough. If I could just pray big enough and good enough, then I could figure out everything God's doing in my life. And I would say, no, this is, this is probably not going to happen. You may see it in hindsight one, t- one day, but you're, you're not going to know. So I've, I've shared this with you guys before. I don't think it's good to try to always figure out what God's doing through every circumstance you find yourself in. I got a flat tire today, but the Lord used it because... Well, maybe you do find a piece of it, but don't pretend like you know the whole story because you will end up frustrating yourself. Like, I got a flat tire today, and oh, it's going to be so I can witness to the guy that comes and, you know, the tow truck or whatever when they come. And then it doesn't work out, you know, and the guy doesn't even talk to you and he's on the phone the whole time and and you're like, "Mm, I thought I knew what the Lord was doing and that's not what the Lord's doing. When you try to assume what God's doing, you set yourself up for being frustrated. You got to rely on his character, not your like precognition of his plans. Uh, Verse 34, it goes on, kind of more of the same, more humbling stuff. It says, for who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor? This is actually from Isaiah 40, 13, and, and some other places in Scripture. Paul's really pulling together a lot of, Scripture says this sort of thing a lot. Um, so who's known his mind? Who's become his counselor? And I would say, well, the, the point here is you don't know his mind. You aren't his counselor. I'm not, God's not like checking with me. Is that okay with you, Mike, if I do that? 
But you might respond, and fairly, but I thought 1 Corinthians 2.15 says we have the mind of Christ. In fact, it quotes the same thing. It says, who's known the mind of the Lord? But we have the mind of Christ. So let me explain the difference between what Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians and what Paul is saying in Romans. In 1 Corinthians, it's saying we have the mind of Christ in the sense of a few ways. Theology is one, that the New Testament reveals this, this fuller theology. So it's like, look at now you see what God had in mind all along. The revelation of Jesus, the, the, the fullness of, of all these things, the Trinity, all this sort of stuff explained in more detail in the New Testament. Um, we also have it in discernment, um, in seeing, I can see spiritual sides to things. I don't have great spiritual knowledge in all areas, but I, I see a spiritual element in life that the carnal person wouldn't see. They just wouldn't see it. I see that when you're, when you're being challenged in this area or that area is having a spiritual side as well. So there's the, knowing the mind of the Lord as you're seeing the spiritual side of things. He seems to be talking about that as well. But Romans 11, 34, verse 34 seems to say this. What you don't know is this. What you don't know is God's unrevealed plans. His agenda for your life in the future. The things he hasn't directly told you about, you don't know. Now, why do I bring this up and make a point of it? Is because sometimes people treat other Christians, usually pastors, as though they are the magic eight ball of God. You are the magic eight balls, right? You, you ask it a question. And then you turn it over and the little triangle or whatever a pyramid thing in there floats to the top and it says things like, try again, <laughs> do it again. And it says, absolutely, yes, you know, and, and you do it until you get the answer you want, right? And then you move on. Sometimes people, though, they treat pastors like this, and I've, I've been the victim of this myself, <laughs> um, where you go to a pastor and you think to yourself on your way up to talk to them, whatever they say, that's God's will. And then you go and you ask them a question. You give them like three sentences when your life is this complicated, but you give it this and you want them to tell you what God's will is for you to do. I know because when I was younger, I did this to people too, right? Because you see them as spiritual and they're bringing out the word of God and they seem to have this insight and all this stuff. And sometimes they feed it a little bit, like as though they maybe know a little more than they do because um, maybe it feels good or maybe they just think they do. I don't know. I would say this, please don't go to pastors and think, um, I have an opportunity to move to Colorado and, uh, and I think I might go there and start a ministry. I'm just going to go to the pastor and be like, pastor, do you think I should move? And whatever he says, I'll do it. I'm like, please don't do that. Here's a great way to use your pastor or any Christian. They're counselors. You give them data. They consider it as a spiritual, godly person. They spit out responses and things for you to think about and consider. But you are accountable for the choice you make in response to all those things. I recommend having multiple people you go to, not just one. And if those people hear only three words and they give you the answer from God and you're thinking, that seems a little weird to me, it's probably really weird. And maybe you didn't give them enough data. Maybe it's not their fault. Maybe they're just trying to, you know, they got to go to lunch that day or something. I don't know. Um, but my recommendation would be use them as counselors. I'm never offended when people don't take my advice. They come and they ask me thoughts and I share my thoughts and I go, there's something to consider, think about, we'll pray about it. But I don't think because I have spoken, you must do what I said because I am Pastor Mike. I, I find that uh, that angers me if, if people do that, to be honest. As spiritual leaders, I, I think it's a type of proud abuse uh, to put that on people, that you have to follow my every whim, like I am totally of the Lord. Now, on the flip side, I do think that when there's leaders in the church and they make split decisions, even if they aren't wise decisions, that I'm called to submit to those things and that God can still work it out because God's, he's got the full plan. So that someone can make a wrong decision, God can still work it out. Perhaps it's the right decision. It's not my call. I'm not going to concern myself with things that are beyond you know, what I'm called to be and do. But when you're making choices for your life, who has known the mind of the Lord, who's become his counselor, don't just assume that there's this sort of glowing spiritual personality who's going to know what everybody has to do with their life. And if I could just get access to that person, like they're Jesus, if I could just touch the hem of their robe, um, I, I don't see things that way. I don't see things that way. And in my experience, it's, it's, not, it's not true. It's just not true. So, let me, let me burst that bubble and do a favor to pastors everywhere. Because if, if, if you are, here's the thought, if you're relaxed enough to go, I can go to pastor and just get some advice and not feel like everything they say is the Lord has spoken. You mean my pastor's not God? And they're just, they're, they're hopefully a godly counselor? Oh, then I'm actually more inclined to go and get some thoughts and some input and some advice and take it from multiple people and make my thought 
uh, based my, my decision based on those things. There is wisdom in a multitude of counselors, the scripture says. So I would say don't, don't go too far with knowing the mind of the Lord. Uh, we, we tend to like our own ideas, right? When we come up with an idea, we think it's the best idea ever. Um, we tend to get hooked on our ideas, you know? Oh, I think I know what God's doing in the Middle East right now. I, can, I just sort of can feel it. I mean, I watch three news reports, you know, so I, I can just kind of tell because I have the spirits. I just kind of know what God's doing around the world with people I've never met. And I'm going to proclaim to you what, what is happening in the, in the Muslim world and in the, in the Jewish world and in all these. Just be cautious about this stuff. Like these are real people and real lives and real things we're talking about. And who has known the mind of the Lord? Let, let's have some humility on these things because we can be wrong. And people who proclaim what God is doing what, what you need to do is this. If you do this, if, if you have a tendency to say, I know what God's doing over here, you, you owe it to yourself, to the Lord, and to those you speak to, to occasionally look over your shoulder and see if you are right. Look back after the fact and say, was I right? Because if you are wrong, then you need to stop. And if you are right, then please keep talking and we would all like to hear from you. Because if you really are right about these things, but don't let it just be this weird spiritual hobby you have of proclaiming the truths of God randomly and doing nothing with it, but just kind of going, I could tell God's called you to such and such. And then you run the other way and you never look back to see if you were right. I remember somebody one time told me, a pastor came and said, he said, Mike, I know that's, that you teach and that sometimes you teach and stuff, but really you're called to be a worship leader. That's your calling. And I just thought, eh. because I had grown enough to be able to say, no, I think, I think you're, I didn't even tell the guy. I just was like, okay, thanks for sharing. You know, I just had a sense about what God's calling was on my life and where my giftings were stronger. And so I continued to do those things. And so I really would look at the other way around. I, I leave, I leave worship something I do. And I serve in that. I love doing that. I love worshiping really more than anything. But, um, but I think, feel that teaching is more my calling. So that's fine. But I wish that person would occasionally look back and say, wow, I took that young guy when he was young in ministry and I told him to go the wrong direction. Maybe I should stop doing that. <laughs> just, just, please, it can be harmful. And the, the sad thing is nobody will ever tell you that the advice you gave was completely wrong. They'll just stop going to you for advice. That's what will happen. And I'd rather not be that guy where, uh, yeah, everybody secretly knows, like he teaches well, but don't ask for his advice. <laughs> I don't want to be that guy. Um, so verse 35, let's keep reading. It says, or who is first given to him and it shall be repaid to him. Another, another rhetorical question. This is probably from Job 41, 11. Who is first given to God and it shall be repaid to him. Like, have you given to God and it was repaid to you? No, this, this highlights grace. Think about this for a second. Every single thing you have in life, everything was given to you. No, I earned it. I worked with the sweat of my brow. Whose brow? Your brow? Your sweat? How'd you get that brow? How'd you get those arms and legs? Oh, I mean, I just kind of, they were just given to me. It started this way. Everything I have in life is a gift. I, this is why an Olympic runner can, can run and win the Olympics, and then he can point up and say, God gets the glory. And then people mock him for it. They were like, man, you're the one that ran. You're the one that worked hard, and you're the one that slaved every day to become a better runner. And he could look back and say, yes, fool, I did all those things. But God gave me legs invented gravity, created my existence, and I just happened to be born into a body that was physically superior to a lot of other people. I was faithful with it, but ultimately God gets the glory. So there's, there's a way of giving God all the glory because what, what did I give to God that he didn't give me first? That's what's being asked in verse 35. Now, this, this is good to realize this because if I take things for granted, I set myself up for, for becoming bitter. We see this like in, in even, even good marriages where there's people who are really high quality spouse material on both sides, but they're bitter at each other because they take everything the other person does for granted. They're not thankful. They see it as owed instead of an offering of love. In the same sense, I can think to God, you owe me this, God. You owe me this. Why isn't blah, blah, blah happening in my life? You owe me this, God. I get bitter because I don't realize everything I have is a gift. So anything I give to God was given to me in the first place. Money, prosperity, ministry, it's all stewardship. Everything in my life is I'm a, I'm a steward of those things. And that, to me, highlights relationship. Because imagine the dad walking through the store with his son or daughter and it's Mother's Day is coming up. And so he says, 
here, kiddo, here's, here's 10 bucks. Get your mom something really special. Or maybe not 10 bucks, but get your mom something really special, you know? <laughs> and the dad gives money to the kid to buy something for mom. Why? I mean, you have to give them the money to make the purchase. Why? Because it's about relationship. Why does God give us things that we might give them back to him? Because it's all about relationship. We're building relationships. So really the, the center point of life is relationships. I see this throughout the scripture. It's all about relationship. And the number one relationship is ours with God. So anything I give to God, he gave to me first. Um, and this means that my giving is relational. That my service to God is relational. He doesn't need me to do anything for him. He wants me to because he loves me. Because it's, it's part of this growing, living relationship with him. That's exciting. And then in verse 36, it says, For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. This, this is saying three different things when it says of him, through him, to him are all things. Those are three different ideas. So let's look at those. The first one is of him are all things. That means he created. Um, God is the only thing that's uncreated. So when, for instance, John 1 says that Jesus, the word uncreated, this is saying that he's God. You know what we call this? Want to hear the fancy term for it? It's divine aseity. Aseity. A-S-E-I-T-Y. And it means self-existence. It, he, God just exists in and of himself. His existence doesn't flow from anything else. He's not created. doesn't begin to exist. Nothing sustains him. Nothing causes him. He's simply self-existent. Um, divine aseity. God's the only thing that's not of something. So of him are all things because he's just... Like if you could somehow strip away the universe and all that is in it, take away every spiritual being, everything that's been created by God, what would be left? Just God. And that's how it would be for all eternity if he chose to have a clock somehow. moving. <laughs> I mean, that would just be all there is. God is, everything is of him. So he created all things. He creates everything. Then it says all things are through him. And you might go, okay, if, you, if everything's of you, well, then why is everything through you? Well, what's the... What's the point of saying both of those things? Why not just pick one? I think the through him is a specific reference to Jesus. Let me give you a few scriptures where it says this. It speaks of the father creating and the son being the one whom all things are created through. Specifically through that word. So John 1, 3, it says all things were made through him, the word, which is Jesus. And without him, nothing was made that was made. So all created things were made through the son. Colossians 1, 16, it says... For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. So they were created through Jesus. Jesus is the topic of Colossians 1 there. In uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, it says, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things. That's what we read in verse 36, of him. And... It says, and we for him and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom are all things and through whom we live. So the father of him through him is the son. Hebrew, was that enough? But there's more. Hebrews 1, 2. It's, it's cool because you see this thread going through multiple authors in multiple places in the Bible. Hebrews 1, 2 says that God has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he's appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. So Jesus is, this is, again, the fancy word for this is the economic trinity. What we mean is, we're just talking about the things that the different members of the trinity do. The Father tends to do these things. The Son tends to do these things. The Holy Spirit tends to, like the Holy Spirit indwells believers. That's the economic trinity. Um, so there's, I like to, to drop those fancy terms. I think it's, it's helpful because it, it gives you like a box to put something in, you know, and then it, you can remember it better. Um, so that's the through him. And then to me, the most interesting part is the to him part. So from him, or excuse me, for of him and through him and to him are all things. So what does this mean, to him? To him means that the end goal of creation is God. The end purpose of everything is the Lord. Philippians 2.13 says this. It says, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. That God's pleasure would be the purpose of the things that are happening in my life, to bring pleasure to God. Hebrews 2.10, it says, For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, 
for whom all things are for him um, and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. God is bringing it all in for him. In uh, Colossians 1.16, which I read earlier, the end of it says this, that all things were created through him and for him. For him. Now we have here it being said, both the Father and the Son are the purpose of creation in these different passages I just read. Now here's what this, why this is interesting to me. Some modern atheist attacks, I'm going to give you an example, because recently there was a debate um, on a radio program in London called Unbelievable, and it's a, it's a British program, and they have Christian atheist, Christian skeptics debate all the time. And one of the mo more popular modern atheists is a guy named Sean Carroll. He's, a, he's an accomplished physicist, very smart guy, and he's very anti God, very anti-belief in God, and he, he says a lot of preposterous, in my opinion, things about God, but he says it in a super smart way. So he's got a lot of followers. Well, one of the things he says in his debate, and this is a point I've heard a lot of times recently in particular, is this. He says that if God really made the universe for man, then wouldn't man be much more important in the universe? Yet the universe is super, super big, and here we are in some distant, random, pointless corner of, the, of a random, normal galaxy, you know, going around a normal looking star and blah, blah, blah. Nothing special about us. I would say there's a couple problems with this. First off, you don't, you don't, like if you're, if you're, your kid might be living in the lamest room of your home. This doesn't mean they're the least imp important person in your house to you. But, but there's another problem with this. And it's this, the universe wasn't made for man. It was made for God. And God made the universe for his own pleasure. And so God thought a gigantic universe with all sorts of different things going on all over the place was more interesting and brought him more pleasure than one tiny universe that just fit one planet with a bunch of humans on it. Because the universe isn't all about you. It's all about God. And so Sean, Sean is, Carol's responding to wrong theology here. That's not Christian theology. So he's, it's a straw man. He's, he's painting a picture of us that is not what we believe. Um, but will, it, will anybody who hears me say this stop saying it that... <laughs> <laughs> that remains to be seen. Um, so, so that I think responds to those atheist attacks. But, but here's the, the thought for me then. If, if all this is for God, if everything that is in the world is, like it says here at the end of verse 36, uh, to whom be glory forever, amen. If the purpose of everything is for God and for his glory, does that mean that I have to pick between my good and God's glory in my life? Because I think a lot of people think they do. It's a choice between what's good for me and the glory of God. And I think that there's, it's slightly more complicated than that. So let me try to unpack this real quick. Um, there is one side of the coin, like where Jesus says, he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. And he says, you have to die to yourself daily. So there is a sense in which, yeah, like, that's, I'm dying to myself. But that's only one side of the coin, because the other side of the coin is this. Jesus said, he who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. What he's saying is, what you're giving up is the life that abandons the purpose of your creation. You're giving up a life of rebellion against the God who made you for himself so that you might have a life with the God who made you for himself. You're giving up the nothing life for the everything life. So there's a sacrifice, but let's be honest. The sacrifices we make as Christians are nothing. Oh Lord, I sacrificed fornication for you. Okay, but if your eyes are open, that's not a sacrifice. That's just wisdom. <laughs> your life is better. It really is better because of this. Lord, I sacrificed ungodly friendships of sin for you. Well, good for you. <laughs> like, you're so sacrificial there. All you're doing is giving up death for life. You're, you're losing. I mean, I can't think of anything I've given up for the Lord that I actually miss. I don't, but I think of things I haven't given up for God and I wish I had. We're dying to the life that does not give glory to God to walk in the fullness of life where we accomplish our full purpose and our full meaning and all that, or all that sort of thing. The Christian life involves a sacrifice, but it's a sacrifice of nothingness for everything, really. Like Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. John 15. Apart, I love the way he words it. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You want to do nothing with your life? Go ahead. Live a life apart from me. In the end, it will amount to nothing. But if you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. So I'm giving up the things which amount to zero 
to zilch for those things which amount to glory for God. So his glory is the highest good my life can accomplish and results in life abundantly. So when I say to whom be glory forever, amen, I, I'm, I'm being ushered, when I give glory to God, I'm being ushered into the fullness of the life that God's called me to do, to have. Some skeptics are bothered by this idea that God should get glory, that we should give all glory to God. And, and they, uh, they actually attack the idea of God, like, like how arrogant. I'm, now I'm speaking their words here, so don't think I mean this, but, but this is what I hear, right? How arrogant of God to want worship, to demand praise and worship. And at first, when I heard this as a younger believer, I thought, let me think that through, you know? And I thought, okay, and I, I, I reconciled the issue. I said, well, I said, well, the difference between me worshiping God versus worshiping like Michael Jackson is that God's worthy of worship. You know, worshiping God versus worshiping like a hamburger, God's worthy of worship. God versus a cow, or God versus a football team. God's worthy, they're not. So, so I, I'm fine with that. But as I keep hearing this, like, it, it just starts to sound like something spiritually wrong with the person saying it. The thing is, God's worthy. To not worship God would be a lie. To live a lie. And to base my life on a lie. To walk in rebellion to the one who made me for himself. I like Psalm 115 verse 1. It says, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory because of your mercy, because of your truth. Not to us, O Lord, but to your name. Because I glory in his glory. But when I glory in my own glory, now I'm not abiding. Now my life amounts to nothing. Empty glorying, pointlessness. But when I glory in his glory, I'm like riding the wave of God's wonderfulness and his goodness in life. That's a heart cry. And that's, that's how it comes off in Paul's writing here. He's like, to whom be glory forever, amen. He's just, this is, I, I want you to imagine what he felt as he wrote those words. And ask ourselves, do I feel this? Is God's glory my highest priority in life? His pleasure more important than my own? Do I find my joy in him and in his glory to glorify him in all that I do? Is it comforting to you that God's glory will come through your hardships? That not just somehow God will work this out and it'll be better for me. I mean, I've got eternal joy coming. What am I worried about right now? Instead, can I be like, Lord, be glorified in whatever's going on in my life right now. Whatever struggle I'm in, show me how to glorify you in this thing because that is the purpose of my life and that's where I find myself abiding and bearing much fruit and finding my joy in you. Now what's amazing about this, here's where I'll end. What's amazing about this to me is this. When my life is really honestly focused on God's glory, and I mean moment by moment, day by day, God's glory in my marriage, God's glory in my parenting, God's glory in my job, God's glory in all those things. And I don't mean, God, you're glorified when my business is making lots of money. Okay, you don't get it. I mean God's glory in my business, not God's glory special lingo for my wealth. <laughs> that's not the point. But God to be glorified in all those things, if that's my goal, then everything changes. And the way I handle the situations I'm in totally changes and it moves me from the narcissistic self-focus to a mind that's focused on the Lord and a heart that is free to bring glory to him. And, um, and I, I don't know how to communicate this other than to, to just say, like, is that our heart? Like, like Job, where he's, all this stuff happens to him and his first reaction was the best one where he says, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Because he's just saying, this is, this is God, you're God. And I acknowledge it, and I recognize it, and I trust it, and I believe it. And I say, blessed be your name. Not, Lord, if you will, A, B, C, my life, then I will have peace. But rather seeing what God has already done and who he already is, and saying, just God, be glorified. You lose yourself in this, but you gain more than that in the loss. It's a, it's, a, it's a nice trade-off. So let's pray. Um, Father, we, we pray this, Lord. Um, help us in our hearts to learn to love your glory more, to learn that your glory is for our good, but yet that's not the point. It's not that we should be going after your glory as a way of getting our good, but rather we should go because your glory is worthwhile, Lord, because you are worth it, because we exist for your pleasure. When we abandon ourselves in, into the loving worshipful 
uh, life of giving glory to God and that becomes our main, our main purpose, our main thing. Everything else, it seems, becomes clear. Hardships, um, we just see them differently. We respond the right way. It's not about us anymore. It's about you. And you, in so many ways, you're about us, so we don't have to worry about that. Lord, we just pray this. Give us a heart that is after your glory and minds where we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Let us learn these lessons, Lord. We, we pray for continuing, continuing revival in our lives as we study your word and we get this theology into us that it would become application into, our, into the way we live our lives. Let us look at the specific things that we're doing, the tasks and stewardships you've given us, and ask, how can I just do this for God's glory instead of just trying to get by? In Jesus' name, amen.